I'm going to hand over now, or very shortly, to uh, my eminent colleague, Professor Andy Bush. Uh, Andy is Professor of uh, Pediatrics at uh, the NHLI, and he's also uh, in the Centre for Pediatrics and Child Care at Imperial College, and he is Consultant uh, Pediatric uh, Chest Physician at the Royal Brompton Hospital. Thanks, and it's a very great honour to be here and to be asked to chair this. Um, you can see the running order there. Without more ado, if I can make this work. Yes, I go. I've been asked to give a very brief introduction. I've got no conflict of interest. What I re really am is a sort of warm-up act for the very distinguished speakers who are going. I'm going to follow. So. I, just as a paediatrician, obviously, one of the things I think about is what happens before birth. And antenatally, the baby is not safe in the womb from the effects of environmental pollution. There are large numbers of studies. This is a particularly impressive Spanish one. Over 600 children who had spirometry made, measured at the age of four and a half. And they looked at the developmental residential exposure um, to benzene and nitrogen dioxide. Uh, and here you can see the benzene exposure in the second trimester of pregnancy on the, on the horizontal axis, um, FEV1 on the vertical axis at age four and a half, and you can see there's this relation. The more benzene in the second trimester of pregnancy, uh, the worse your lung function at four and a half, and the same as well for nitrogen dioxide. And in this study, not necessarily others, it was particularly pregnancy, and unsurprisingly, you did worse if you were allergic, and you did worse if you were of low socioeconomic status. Uh, it's always better to be rich and exposed to something nasty than poor and exposed to something nasty, whatever the nasty is. So our babies are not safe. And um, actually, these, who cares about these early changes? You know, it's four and a half, they'll grow out of it, they'll all be fine. Well, just to say this isn't the case, these are Tucson participants, and they had in, in Arizona, the first and greatest, perhaps, of the paediatric cohort studies. They had lung function measured at two months of age. They were followed up with questionnaires prospectively six to 36 years of age, and a subset with spirometry and HRCT. The two lung function tests, I won't bore you with the details, this is a tidal breathing parameter. This is a squeeze parameter to mimic the flow volume curve. And you can see in the, in the, for, the, for the, those in, the, for the, in red, for the, the lowest tercile of the, of the tidal breathing, right through life, to age 36, they are more likely to have asthma. Same again, more likely to have, uh, to have asthma if they were in the lowest ter tercile of uh, Vmax FRC. And those that were in the lowest tercile for both, two-thirds of them had adult asthma. So these early life events, the, the pollution damage is not something you can laugh off and it is going to get better. And the subset that had CT scans showed structural airway changes if you had the poor lung function early on. Um, and ju just going on further from this again, this is the Melbourne birth cohort. Um, they were recruited at age 7 to 10. At age 50, they rephenotyped their group and backtracked the lung function. So here you can see at age 50, COPD diagnosis, current asthma, no asthma or remitted asthma. And if you backtrack to age 7 to 10, the COPD group already had the worst lung function. And whatever had caused the damage had happened somewhere over here before recruitment. So again, exposing pregnant women to pollution is unlikely to be something that, you're, that is going to, you're going to get rid of the effects of very early on. And in this study, indeed, the, the COPD study, severe asthma is a very bad thing to have. Um, Postnatally, problems, but the great thing is legislation works. And I think that's really important. Uh, I suspect we'll hear more about this very briefly. The Children's Health Study is held in California. Three time-dependent cohorts in five <coughs> communities mean age at 11, stopped to age 15, annual spirometry, and over the course of this study, in association with change in state and government policies, air quality improved. Uh, and you can see these are slightly confusing graphs, because instead of going from 0 
but here to higher numbers here it goes in the reverse direction sorry about that you can see here for FBC as nitrogen dioxide in the atmosphere improves PM 2.5 PM 10 improves you can see children's lung growth improves and you get exactly the same information from FEV1 so legislation works. And of course, if legislation doesn't work, let's get rid of Parliament straight away and save the money and spend it on something else. Legislation works. And some lessons from uh, again, uh, vulnerability. This is a lung cancer paper. Um, this is at nearly a half a million UK biobank studies. And they looked at uh, in utero smoke exposure. They didn't have pollution, but I think it has a lesson for pollution an age at smoking onset, and they also looked at some genetics, and they looked at lung cancer incidents and deaths during nearly nine years of follow-up. And the results were scary, because here you can see in, an in utero exposure to tobacco smoke meant that if you were, your risk of cancer later on was in, enhanced. I think what this is saying to me is that, again, if, you're, if, if you've got... If, it, it, I can't be complacent about what the effects of pollution early on might not be in terms of later toxicities. And the age of smoke, and now thinking of the age of smoking initiation, the earlier you smoke, if you start smoking in childhood or adolescence, again your cancer risk is increased dramatically. And the, my suspicion would be, and the hypothesis would be, that early exposure to pollution is something that is going to be very, very dangerous in the long term. COVID, you can't give a lecture without mentioning COVID. Sorry about this, Frank. Lessons to learn. Um, what happened to, in co to asthma in COVID? Well, this is one of many studies in Pennsylvania. They looked at a big emergency department and asthma admissions, and they tri looked at triage data for acuity of attacks and compared with other <coughs> indications for emergency department visits. And what you can see is all asthma attendances absolutely plummeted during COVID. And it didn't matter whether it was severe, mild, or moderate, they all plummeted. It wasn't just that, they, the, the, that the mild ones stayed at home. And lots of people have speculated, undoubtedly less viral transmission is important. But other things happened in COVID times. So these are some pollution maps. Um, before the pandemic, in the pandemic, that's China. Uh, they, 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 you can, there you can see more Far East data, uh, European data, it's more European data. I cannot prove it, but I would be unsurprised if the, that some of the improved asthma outcomes were not related to the improved pollution in COVID times. What about transgenerational effects? Um, we, if, your gra if grandparents smoke, if grandmother smokes, daughter's more likely to smoke and her child's more likely to have asthma. But there's a direct effect. If grandma smokes, her grandchildren are more likely to have asthma even if her daughter does not. What about pollution exposure to this grandmother? Is that going to have transgenerational effects? I see there's a, there's a sample of it. There's a, a symposium coming up, up and I hope you'll have some more about this. Uh, what about fathers and grandfathers? Um, this is again uh, from the Tasmanian study. They looked at logistic regression for offspring asthma at age seven and different types of asthma. And they looked at fathers' passive smoke exposure aged less than 15. And if they were exposed to smoke, their offspring's risk of non-allergic asthma increased. Again, we don't have the data for pollution, but I can't believe that pollution is going to be a good thing for these for old men like me. And passive smoke exposure before completing puberty and later active smoking increased, increased asthma. So are we getting transgenerational effects through the males as well as the females? And finally, Alvaro Gusti's data, if you want to have good lung function, Choose a parent with good lung function. If you stuff, if, if, if for whatever reason your parents are stuffed by both pollution or smoking, if you've got here, you've got uh, offspring FEV1 in early adulthood, there if you've got two normal parents, there if you've got at least one low parent, and it does, R squared is nearly 30% for the, the effect of parents' average FEV1 on the child's FEV1. 
And this is such a strong correlation. If I didn't know Alvar better, I thought the data were fake. It looks, yeah, so it looks really, really strong. So where now? What can we do about it? And this was a paper about purifying air in Africa, but I thought it probably had a lot of lessons for us. And they had three things that we should be changed. Technology, um, policy, no gas in new builds, mandate solar panels, and education and behaviour change. Understanding the effects of pollution for life and understanding the vulnerability of children. And this was the, this was the paper, which I thought was a very interesting one. <coughs> 